Why don't you turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy 4. I don't know if you noticed, but during the last two hymns that we sang, there's something of a theme that's there, where he says, you know, we're going to be enemies to many. We're going to go through very difficult times. And then in this last one, you actually sang about the Lord allowing hardship and pain to come. I'm not sure if you realize that you sang that prayer to the Lord, because he uses that, doesn't he? And part of what we see with that is actually identifying with our Lord Jesus Christ, being able to be those that don't come to be served, but to serve and even give our lives like our Lord Jesus. So before we look at 1 Timothy 4 verse 6, I want to read to you a section in Matthew. So maybe keep your finger at 1 Timothy 4 verse 6 and then go back in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20. And uh, let me open again in a word of prayer. And then we'll consider this. Lord, thank you that we have this marvelous privilege of being together this evening. We do pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would be exalted. That you would have free reign amongst us to work in us, to change our hearts, O Lord, where we need to be changed, where we need to be challenged. It may be possible that some here have become like the Dead Sea, where there's been water flowing in, life flowing in, but just a deadness in the heart. And I pray that we would not be like that, that we would be a people that stream with life because of what Christ has done for us. So we pray, Lord, that you would minister to us and that we would be those that would seek to minister to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This section can be entitled A Good Minister's Discipline or A Good, a good Minister's Calling in a sense. But let's look for a moment at what we see in Matthew chapter 20. Now we have um, two men that are training to be deacons at the moment or in the testing phase of deaconing. And we get together at, on a Friday morning, 5 o'clock, before the other men come to pray. The other men come at half past 5, those two men come at 5. And um, they get nervous about being late because then we make it earlier and we come earlier. But um, part of what's the joy of that is we get to go through various passages together. And I think that there's probably one of the greatest passages in this verse that I'm going to read to you regarding deaconing. Um, because our Lord Jesus actually calls himself a deacon. And tonight, you thought you were done with deaconing. But in 1 Timothy 4 verse 6, we see our word deacon again. And he's just gone through 1 Timothy 3, talking about the overseer, talking about the deacons. And then again now in 1 Timothy 4 verse 6, actually Timothy's called to be a good deacon. And I'll show you that in a moment. But look with me at Matthew chapter 20 and looking from verse 25. And notice what our Lord Jesus does with his disciples. Because there's this request just earlier on from verse 20 up until verse 24 where you've got James and John's mom comes to ask of Jesus. Can they sit at the right and at the left? And these men seem to have been in on it because the other disciples get really upset about the fact that you've got um, these two that were looking for this prominence there. And look with me there at verse 25. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. He's talking to his disciples. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. This is, by the way, the word that we get for deacon. The one that would seek to be great among you actually should be the deacon among you, should be the servant among you. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Now, this is the comparison that Jesus gives as he's talking to his disciples about this. Remember, there's two that are vying for position. And the others are upset because they want that position. They're not upset because they go, how dare you ask for that position. They're upset because they didn't think of it first. Why didn't we get our mommy to come and talk to you, Jesus? Maybe then we would have gotten the right hand and the left hand of you. And they were so busy debating who's going to be the greatest amongst the disciples. By the way, that debate went into the first Lord's Supper. That's how much they were busy debating with each other. Who's going to be the greatest? 
We're coming into the kingdom. Remember, they sang Hosanna and threw down palm branches and threw down their coats. And as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem and they thinking to themselves, he's about to establish his earthly kingdom. He's the Messiah that the Bible's speaking about. They're about, they're thinking, we're into the millennial reign. How, how many cities are we going to reign over? Who, where are we going to be positioned? They're busy fighting about that position all the way until the Lord's Supper, where Jesus, knowing that he's about to go to the cross, lays aside his outer garments. And what does he do? He becomes their slave. He fulfills what we see here. He becomes slave to them. He serves them. Even there at the table, they're asking him, who's going to betray you, Lord? Surely not I, surely not I. But the one I give the bread to, the one I give the cup to, he does this with Judas. He looks at Judas in the face. He says, go do what you need to go do. Do it quickly. And guess what the other disciples think? They think, obviously Judas is his favorite. (laughs) Sorry. So stay up here and I'm breaking your guitar already. See I think I even hit the strings there, you know. They're busy fighting about who's going to be the greatest. Judas must be the favorite, right? He's, he gets a special errand, even. And Jesus has been saying to him, not so amongst you. Listen to what he compares this to in verse 24. And here's the passage, the verse, I think, out of the whole of the New Testament, um, that this is probably the key verse for deacon, out of all of them. He says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be deacon, but to deacon, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Well, the English translation is served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. What do you think the model is when it comes to the way that the disciples of Jesus Christ are meant to be? Should we be vying for positions? Should we be lording it over one another? No. In fact, we ought to be serving one another. As our Lord Jesus Christ served us. And how much did He serve us? He served us completely. He gave His life in service for us. Isn't that marvelous? Now look with me at 1 Timothy 4 verse 6. We did mention 1 Timothy 4 verse 6 in our last evening service. But I thought it good to spend the whole sermon simply on this verse, because this is part of what we see. Paul is now speaking again to his protege, Timothy, who is at the moment the pastor of Ephesus. And he's been sent there to keep some people quiet, and to teach good doctrine, and to to put things in order in the church, as we saw in 1 Timothy 3, regarding the overseer, regarding the deacon regarding those that would serve in the congregation. Because remember that deacons really are big S servants within a congregation, recognized servants amongst the servants. Because all members within a local congregation are to serve as we've been served by Jesus. We have not just been saved by Jesus to sit in a position of being served continuously. We've been saved to serve. And to give our lives as a ransom like our Lord Jesus gave his life as a ransom. And that is our act of service to him who has loved us. We start to see the church in the eyes of, or through the eyes of our Lord Jesus. So look there at 1 Timothy 4 verse 6. In pointing out these things to the brothers, or in other translations to the brethren, that brothers, the brethren there, includes the whole church. That is the term that was used for the brothers and the sisters. They were called brethren. So, in pointing this out to the brothers, you will be a good servant. You will be a good deacon of Christ Jesus. Be nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. Now, that word there, good servant, I think it could very well have been translated deacon because we have that in 1 Timothy 3. This is the same word for deacon. You'll be a good deacon. Now, it seems confusing, doesn't it? But he's the pastor of the church, right? Did you know that any pastor of the New Testament church of the Lord Jesus Christ is a deacon too? (laughs) Like he's a member, like he's a sheep, like he's a part of that body, but he too 
is a servant leader. He too is deaconing in his service of the church. You'll be a good servant. But interestingly enough, he says, of Christ Jesus. Now, what does Jesus say back in, in Matthew 20, verse 28? As the Son of Man did not come to be served. The Son of Man didn't come to be deacon. But to deacon and to give his life as a ransom for many. So some transition has happened since the death the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, now, because of the mercy of God and the fact that you and I can be born again from above and filled with the Holy Spirit, now you and I have the opportunity to deacon Jesus Christ, to serve Him. Isn't that absolutely marvelous? Think of that. He who didn't come to be served, but to serve, is now served by us. Because of the marvelous work that he accomplished at the cross. And I think that there's the reason that many don't actually do what they called to do when they were saved. Is they don't get it. They don't get the marvelous work that Jesus did. Because you have a small view of his mercy. A small view of what he accomplished at the cross for you. And so then you don't do it. And then you become like the Dead Sea. Stuff must flow into you but you're just dead. You give nothing out. And it adds up salt and adds up salt, and then people pay a lot of money to go float in it. But nothing lives there. No fish live there. No life is there. And, and marvelously, I just love the thought of this. You know, when our Lord Jesus, and we'll get there in Zechariah chapter 14, when the Lord Jesus puts his feet down again on the Mount of Olives and there's this, mo this massive earthquake as he comes to save his people and the earth is split and actually you find from the sea, you know, these people sing about the river to the sea, uh, they have this whole song these days about the river to the sea, but actually from the sea to the Dead Sea will stream with life and the Dead Sea will be a living sea. And sometimes that needs to happen in hearts where you need to realize what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you, so that you too would want to be a good servant, a good deacon of Christ Jesus. And but he's speaking here again to Timothy, and he says, Be nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. So interestingly enough here, we find that Timothy is actually nourished by his ministry. He's nourished. He actually gains by giving. He's doing this ministry. He's putting these things that the Apostle Paul says, put this before the brethren. And actually, your form of being nourished comes from you serving. And through you doing. And through you being moved by God to actually give out. Because then Christ is living and active in you. You see where I'm going with the sermon, don't you? We can't be those that do not serve when we've been saved by Jesus Christ. It's just something that moves us as Christians. We can't help it because we were never saved by good works, at least not by our own good works. We were saved by the good works and perfect works of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were never saved by our own good person. None of us are good. None of us have done good. We were saved by Jesus' good works. But when that happens, guess what happens? We begin to do the good works. Because we've been saved by Him who gave His life as a ransom for me. What a wonderful passage for us to consider. This is not just true for Timothy. Of course, in the special context of, of Ephesus and what Paul had sent him to do, yes. But the truth remains, if you want to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for the cause of Christ, you gain it. These are the truths that we see within the Scriptures. This is the call towards discipleship. What a profound connection between ministering to others and then being spiritually nourished ourselves. Now we have been banging a few drums here at Benoni Bible Church a number of times. But there's four main things that I've been banging over and over and over again in different sermons and in different ways. One, that you need to be spending time in God's Word, in personal devotion, and in particular that our men 
who are to be leading their wives and their children in family devotion time. That's absolutely critical. Secondly, that aspect of corporate prayer. How important corporate prayer is for us. I was just singing in my mind this last week, sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer. And I want to send that on to the FYI this week regarding our Wednesday night uh, time of corporate prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. How important it is for us to be involved in corporate prayer as a body of believers. Because if God doesn't choose to do something and doesn't act, then, I mean, we can be doing all the other things that we do until we're blue in the face. It's Him that must work in us, isn't it? I mean, He by His Holy Spirit through His Word. But then also, I've been banging that drum of the Lord's Day. The morning service, the evening service. Being committed to the Lord. We meet in the morning to commemorate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. And we meet in the evening because the early church met in the evening. It is the Lord's day. We set it aside for that. Setting aside this day for hospitality. Opening your homes. Having one another over. Showing love of Christ towards one another. And then the last drum I've been banging, which you've probably heard many times and in different sermons, is that you must use the gift that God has given you to use. I don't want to say use it or lose it, <laughs> no, but use it. Start somewhere. Say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ where you see a gap, serve. Because He served us. If indeed Christ is special to you, if indeed what Jesus did at the cross has that penny has dropped, then serve. And part of the role that we have as elders and even deacons in this church, is to go, how can we help you develop your gift? Actually, the, the part of the job title of the elder is to equip the saints for the works of ministry. It is you as disciples of Jesus Christ that are to be ministers of Jesus Christ. That's one of the reasons that we don't lord it over one another. There's no special authority that elders or, or deacons have. In Baloney Bible Church, every single member is to minister. Yes, the elders and the deacons have certain gifts that God has given, but every single individual is to be like that flowing stream that brings life. Not the Dead Sea that just takes the service of others and lets all of that happen. And you know what happens with that? Oh, it's so sad. It's so sad when you see this happen, especially in a prolonged way in the life of an individual. You know what starts to happen? A person in their spiritual life and in their life in general become like a shriveled up prune. It's so incredibly sad. They become more cynical. They become more condemnatory. They become more critical. They become more moany. They become grumblers. They become complainers. They become those that always know how other things ought to be done better. Because give me, give me, give me. And I want, I want, and I will write a review. And I'll tell you how you should do what you do. When I do squat. And I just sit back and moan. And guess what happens when individuals within the church of God begin to serve. Oh, the joy of the Lord begins to come in there. They stop moaning so much because they're busy with the thing that the Lord has given them to do. And they recognize when they do the thing that God gave them to do, that should anybody moan and complain about what they do, then it hurts. And that they know that they're not doing it as perfectly as they wish to do it. They look at Jesus and they see the perfection of who Christ is. And they go, oh, that I would be more like Him. Oh, that I would be less selfish. Oh, that I would be more giving. Oh, that I would be the one that, that, that bends over for others. That others may be lifted up. So that comparison of the Dead Sea really just highlights some of those key aspects of the Christian life. Because like the Dead Sea, which receives water, but there's no outflow, there's this, with a stagnant spiritual life, there's this lack of vitality. There's a lack of fruitfulness. In contrast, when believers are moving with Christ, serving with Christ, that's like a flowing river that brings God's blessing and truth with it. 
There's growth that happens. There's fruit that comes. There's this active outflow that keeps our faith vibrant and reflecting that abundant life that flows with Jesus. So let's look at the exposition of this verse in verse 6 and see the good minister's discipline. Firstly, he's to be pointing out these things. This is Timothy in particular, but he's to be pointing this out. This is any good minister would point out what Timothy's pointing out. He, he reflects on that context of what we've just seen. He's, he's just spoken about in verse 1 to 3 about apostasy and about false doctrine. That is important when it comes to the ministry within the church of God. You might not be seen as a good servant to the church by some in the church, but Jesus says you've been a good servant of me when you stick to what I've given in my word. When you do what the Bible says, you're my servant. When you ignore what the Bible says and go your own way, of course, you would not be a good servant. You'd be one that was found wanting. But the Spirit explicitly warned that in later times to Paul and to Timothy that some would fall away from the faith, influenced by deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And so Paul says to Timothy, when you point this out, you'll be a good servant of mine. What a gravity of that false teaching that you see there. There in verse 2, Paul describes the characteristic of false teachers. That would be the opposite of what we see in verse 6. He emphasizes their hypocrisy, their deceitful nature, and their deceptive nature. These individuals with seared consciences propagate lies that undermine the fundamental truths of Christianity. That's opposite to these true servants of Jesus. There in verse 3 to 5, as we looked at before, Paul addresses specific false doctrines that these individuals were bringing relating to marriage and to dietary restrictions, and some were advocating for abstinence from marriage and from certain foods, contrary to what God had designed and what was God's purpose. And so Paul then reaffirms that everything created by God is good and sanctified when received with thanksgiving, grounded in the truths of God's word. So Timothy's role is crucial in pointing these truths out to the church. Exposing falsehood is part of being a good servant, a good deacon of Jesus Christ. That is part of upholding sound doctrine for the edification and the protection of the church. Let me tell you, as a pastor that has made a number of enemies by doing this, that this is not necessarily fun. But who counts most? The Lord Jesus does. If this is Jesus' church and we are Jesus' servants, then we must do things by Jesus' way. And that might not bring you much popularity. But Jesus says, that's been a good servant of mine. Live by my word. Uphold my word. You see there that he is becoming this good servant, this good deacon of Jesus. There in verse 6 again. Paul articulates there this profound truth about the role of a minister, of any godly minister, of any godly servant of Jesus. He's to be this deacon of Christ Jesus. Now, brothers and sisters, part of what this is, is actually looking through the people here at Benoni Bible Church and seeing Jesus who you serve. You, you'll find almost any excuse not to serve when you look at one another. Right? But when we look through one another and we see the one who is intimately connected to his church, the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul understood this very vividly. Remember what happened to him on the road to Damascus? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord, that I'm persecuting? Jesus is already ascended from the earth, which will take part in that. that um, we're guests, actually, at that corporate um, Ascension Day service at Benoni Baptist. I told them we'd bring the filter coffee because I just can't stomach the red coffee. We'll have to like help Benoni Baptist be converted towards good coffee, right? So there's something that Benoni can contribute, good coffee. We're going to take that along. But we're we enjoying the Ascension Day 
service this coming Thursday because Jesus ascended on high. How can Jesus be getting persecuted? How could Jesus be getting persecuted when he's at the right hand of the Father on high, glorified in victorious victory over the death and over the grave, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father because his work on earth is finished? How could he be getting persecuted? Well, it's because he has a bride, and his church is his bride. I mean, you all know that I'm really not an angry person at all, ever. I mean, I don't shout, I don't... Touch my wife! <laughs> and you will see. I mean, I don't know, this stuff it gets, gets recorded, but, you know, I'm just using this as an illustration. Doesn't matter how big he is, I'll chop him up. Okay. Illustration for the recording. <coughs> But that's how I feel about my wife. How do you think Jesus feels about his bride, the church? How intimately connected is Jesus for his bride, the church? He gave his very life for her. He laid down his life for his bride, the church. He who did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. That ransom has been paid. And the moment that you looked to Jesus so that you would live, you became a part of his bride. And you're busy being washed by Jesus. Even now, you're busy being prayed for by Jesus. Even now, Jesus is still actively involved in what's happening in you. And you are part of his collective bride. He loves his church. When you serve Jesus' church, you serve Jesus. When you persecute Jesus' church, you persecute Jesus. That's how intimately close he is to his church. So ask yourself then, what are you doing to Jesus? What are you saying about Jesus? How are you behaving towards Jesus? And let me tell you how we know. How are you behaving towards the local church? And are you serving the local church? Are you serving with the gifts that the Lord has given you, being the body part that He has called you to be? We need a spleen. We need a kidney. We need a big toe. We need to be the body part that God has called us to be. And if He says to you, if He says to you, stand in the corner at attention, and if that's the command he gave you, and you stand in the corner at attention, that is just as faithful as the one that is on the battlefield slaying the enemies of demons. Because he said it to you. There's no comparison between this servant of Jesus and that servant of Jesus and this servant of Jesus. The point is, you serve his body the way that God had made you to serve his body. You be that body part. And guess what happens when you do this? Because this happened with Timothy. Timothy was being reminded, because remember, we call Timothy Timoth Timothy. Because Timothy, in the sense that he was getting scared, he knew some of the things he needed to say to the church. But man, I have to confront some of the elders there. What do you mean? I'm a young man in my 30s. What do you mean I need to go to them and actually tell them the way that it is? What do you mean I need to practice things like church discipline? Just as a funny story, I got to um, Middleburg Baptist. I was 22 years old when I started there, and there was a church discipline issue in the church. And one of the deacons said, you need to understand, pastor, we haven't had church discipline in over 10 years. I think you, that, that's just their private life. And I said, what do you mean? If we haven't done what the Bible says in 10 years regarding that, should, should we just not do any baptisms if we haven't done baptisms in 10 years? Do you think I wanted to do church discipline? I know what it was like to feel like a timid Timothy. Go and tell some people to be quiet. Go tell some people to stop talking in the church. You think that's easy for Timothy to do, especially when it's entrenched leaders in the congregation? But part of the reality is, if Timothy wanted to be nourished, and I believe that this is in particular the spiritual nourishment that flows out even to the physical nourishment. Because when you do good, you feel good. That goes back to Genesis chapter 4. Remember what happened with Cain? 
when he didn't do good, he didn't feel good. And his face became downcast and he became angry. Physically, it began to show what was happening spiritually. And for Timothy, the nourishment actually comes from doing what Timothy was gifted to do. He was to put those things before the brothers. Because that's what you see. He's nourished by the words of faith and sound doctrine by actually doing the ministry that he was called to do. Paul emphasizes the essential role of the spiritual nourishment in the life of the minister. Sometimes people will say to me, thank you, pastor, for that sermon. That was really convicting. And one of my answers has been, if a shotgun pellet hit you, the full blast went through me. Because I'm nourished by giving God's word. Because I'm studying God's word. That's the same with Timothy. The nourishment of the servant of Christ comes through actually serving in the way that God has called you to serve. So if you're not feeling very nourished in your spiritual life, could it be that you're not seeking to nourish your brothers and sisters? Do you see the connection? Ministers in particular must be continually nourished by the words of faith. They must be committed to the full counsel of God's word. That's something that Timothy was called towards. And let me tell you, if you as a member in the body of Christ are committed to the full counsel of God's word, guess what starts to happen? You can't help it but live out the faith that you're busy learning about. Because actually, the Bible even tells us that if you proclaim to have faith and there's no deeds, that is called dead faith. That's not the faith we read about in the Bible. So that the, just as much as, you know, you, you would think about your own diet, I'm sure, especially as you get a little bit older, and I'm seeing more gray hairs on me. That's because, like, each one is a church member. Some, I have, like, I have a whole tuft for some of my deacons, you know. Like, we think about nourishment, right? You, you didn't when you were maybe 20. Some of the younger people, yeah, you know, they're not thinking too much about that. They, uh, they just eat whatever's there. Uh, eat it all. But then as you get older, you're like, hmm, maybe I should say no to three cook sisters. Yeah. But just as we think about physical nourishment and how that is necessary for the body and for bodily health, spiritual nourishment through God's word is indispensable for spiritual vitality. And we're going to see that a little bit further on in First Timothy 4, Lord willing, next week or the week after. So ministers are called to cultivate a lifestyle of meditating on, studying, and living out the truths of Scripture. In fact, I don't even like it when somebody says, where's your office? Because pastors don't have an office. They have a study. They, they study God's Word. And I, and I think that um, Christians, if they've come to saving faith and they used to have something called a man cave, they should turn that into a library because they should be studying. No such thing as a man cave for the Christian. <laughs> you, know, you live out in the light. Right? So ministers are called to do this. To illustrate this concept using the analogy of a tree that's planted by streams of water, we can look at something like Psalm 1, verse 1 to 3. What happens when you are delighting and meditating on God's word? Your tree gives out fruit in due season. It's a leaf doesn't wither. It is planted. It's planted. It's not like the chaff that is blown around by the wind, but planted. I'd encourage you to go and study again Psalm 1, and you'll see that. You'll see the way in which we're called to be those ones that I guess you could even say oaks of righteousness. I've heard of some men's ministries called oaks of righteousness. The only South Africans would get it. I don't think they call people oaks anywhere else. So, we are encouraged to prioritize regular intake of the scriptures, but not for the sake of simply being the dead sea, so that we might minister, so that the Lord may flow through us with that living water. We must be grounded also in sound doctrine, as we see with, with Timothy encouragement here. 
Sound doctrine forms the foundation of effective ministry. When you have sound doctrine, you begin to have sound practice, which then affects sound feelings. We've touched on this many a time, that orthodoxy, orthopraxy, orthopathy. Okay, Right doctrine, right practice, right feelings. So if you're not feeling right, you've got to ask yourself, are you doing right? If you're not doing right, then you've got to wonder, do I think right? Have I got this, the truths of God's word in my heart? Am I hiding God's word in my heart so that I might not sin against Him? And if I am claiming to hide God's word in my heart, but I'm still sinning against Him, then what's going on? Am I turned off to the Lord? Am I not obedient to Him? Have I grieved Him? Have I stopped allowing Him to be Lord? Have I thought that I can be Lord over Him and do what I want and have some kind of an independence, but then read the Bible to appease my conscience? You've got to ask yourself these questions. That's one of the reasons that we have the Lord's Supper every two weeks. Because you are to examine yourselves to see whether you are in the truth. And to see if He is flowing through you. Are you filled with the Spirit of God to overflowing? You, know, you should be saying, my cup runneth over. Well, how are you today, brother? My cup runneth over. There's a good answer. Because the Lord fills us. And He works in us by His Word. And don't tell me that you're filled with the Spirit of God when you're not filled with God's Word. He's the one that has inspired His Word. And He's the one that illuminates His Word. So if you are filled with God, you'll be filled with His Word. But we must have this ongoing spiritual growth and doctrinal grounding if we are to be effective ministers of the Gospel. Whether minister, small m, big m, doesn't matter, in between m, we're ministers. When we are disciples of Jesus, we're ministers of the gospel. We're part of a body of believers. And you know what happens as well? People love to have these courses, EE3, and then they have a new generation and they call it XEE and, you know, give it new names and these courses. And, and you know what? Even what's funny is you have to pay quite a lot of money sometimes to even go on some of these courses where they will teach you. The professionals will teach you how to be a professional evangelist an evangelizer. But you know what the Bible tells me? It says, by your love for one another, the world will know that you're his disciples. I don't think that we really need any other teacher than the Holy Spirit and his open Bible to start to love one another. How are you going to love one another? Serve one another. Do what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he lay aside his outer garments and he took that bucket and he washed the feet of his disciples. What love did Jesus have? And such a love that, by the way, at that point in the supper, Judas hadn't even left yet. And that always just strikes me as I think about this. That those very feet that would go out later to betray Jesus with 30 silver coins were washed by Jesus in such a manner that he was not having his feet washed anything different than what Peter's feet were washed or John's feet were washed. What kind of a love is that? What kind of a love is that? That's the kind of love with which you were loved. Because while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Isn't that the love that drew you? That's that love. That love of Jesus. What kind of humility? You know, Philippians 2 puts it beautifully. He says that he took on the form of a servant. He was born in the likeness of man. He became nothing. And he was obedient even to the point of death on the cross. That's how humble Jesus is. He said, we're encouraged then in Philippians 2 to have that kind of mind among us. The mind of the humility of Christ. Where we will serve like that. What kind of a service was that from our Lord Jesus? When we're nourished on God's word, that's the obvious outflow. That's what we do. And I praise God, I'm seeing that more and more at Benoni Bible Church with you all. But as you do this, guess what the Bible says? Do it even more. Grow up in this. You know, you've been doing well. Do even better. Don't grow weary of doing good, the Bible says. Do it even more. Serve even more. When you start feeling a bit grumbly, a bit complainy, a bit like, man, I've been on my hands and knees washing too many feet then ask Jesus for the power to wash another hundred feet. 
Do it all the more. Because the best form of evangelism that there is in the scriptures and in God's eyes is you and me loving one another like that. Doing what God had called us to do. I've been thinking about that quite a bit recently because I'm so frustrated about what I see in our country. I don't know about you. Man, it frustrates me. And I think to myself like, I mean, the other day I was thinking of starting a court case with the ICC against the ANC. You know, ICC, ANC, court case. You know, man, you know, they, they want to sue Israel when there's like 68 murders in our country a, like a day? I mean, we have so many murders in our country. We have like the top country when it comes to rape. And that's the rapes that are reported. How many of them are just cast away? We're living in a gangster's country run by criminals that hate what God does. <laughs> That's, but I'm so frustrated about that. And I'm like, what should we do? The Bible tells us the church will change the country if the church would just be the church. So what should we do? Be the church. That's what we should do. We should love the way that the church must love. We must serve the way that the church must love. We must be the church. And guess what then happens when we're a healthy church? We begin to propagate. Because anything that is healthy propagates. It bears fruit. That's what a healthy tree does. That's what a healthy church does. So guess what we'll start to do? We'll start to plant other churches. We'll start to send our missionaries. We'll start to do the very great commission that you and I have been called towards. But until we start taking Jesus seriously and taking his word seriously, we will just be the Dead Sea. And then we'll be the Dead Sea collectively. And you know what the Dead Sea does? It doesn't pray. It doesn't love. It doesn't serve. It has no life in it. It's time for you and I to be a flowing stream that brings life by the help of the Holy Spirit. So what is the application? I'm trying to find my timer here because somehow it went off. And I don't want to you know, make... Oh, there we go. We've got lots of time. Okay. What should we do? Minister to one another. Minister to one another. Stop thinking all the time about yourself. Stop it. Minister to one another. Okay? I mean, who wants to have a Christian that's like basically the picture of, you remember Narcissus? That Greek mythology where we get the word Narcissist from? You remember what happened to him? He was such a handsome guy. Really handsome went down and one day he saw the reflection of himself in the pool. And he goes, wow, I'm about to break more things. Wow, I'm lo look at how handsome I am. He fell in love with his own reflection. And so he just stayed there looking at himself until he rotted and died. I mean, who wants that kind of a Christian? What will Benoni Bible Church be if all of us are like that? We'll be just worrying about ourselves in front of the mirror. Hey, look at that. Actually, James even says that, by the way. You know, if you go away and you forget what you look like when you look in God's Word, let that reflect into you, change your heart, and cause you to serve. So minister to one another. We are to be encouraged by God the Holy Spirit this evening to embrace opportunities of ministry. I mean, we, we're trying to do things like that to help you with that. I mean, it's so cool when the world sets up things that helps us with that. I mean, like WhatsApp brings out this community thing, and we're able to have a WhatsApp community with all of our different service opportunities. I mean, how cool is that? The world set that up for us. I mean, just for Benoni Bible Church, I think. We've got like 25 groups on there. They were all in existence before, and we just, got them, we just put them all together. And you can like see, and you can go, ooh, and just try it out. I mean, maybe there's something there that you look at and you go, what do you mean tech ministry? Okay, what do you mean care ministry? What do you mean with uh, tea ministry? What do you mean with this? Well, how can I serve? Well, let me just try it out and go do it for three months. Let me serve 
I mean, very soon, if you join music ministry and all you play is the electric triangle, soon they'll tell you you can't serve very well with that. And then you'll realize within three months that you shouldn't be there. Like, you'll soon figure it out. If you join team ministry as well, and you're standing there going, you want tea? You know, the people will be like, listen, I don't really feel much love right here, you know. We've got some guys that need to be part of the offering committee, you know, if there's ever a will be for money. But serve one another. But also notice that there's personal nourishment that comes through service. It's very opposite to what the world says, right? The world says, you just pamper yourself and you'll be nourished. The Bible says, pamper one another and you'll be nourished. That's Jesus' way. Serve and you'll actually find that you'll be served. I found it quite, um, I don't want to say amusing because it's not amusing at the times that this has happened. But there's been times in the past where you have this person that's just so disgruntled. You know? This is such an unloving church. Mm. You just say to them, hey, have you tried hugging somebody? You know? Like, and because, like, are we talking about the same church here? You know, like, like I, I know the people here. And they're pretty loving. But I, the, the big difference often between me and that individual is that I'm loving the people in the church. And that person isn't. They're not loving. They're not a loving person. So guess what happens? They don't feel very loved. They never ever hug somebody, so they never get a hug. You're nourished when you nourish others. When you're busy doing what God called you to do, as the body part that you're meant to be, oh, how glorious. There's there that that comes. So Paul also gives us this um, idea, you can jot it down if you wish, Second Corinthians eleven twenty-three. 23, he speaks about the fact that he's a minister. He talks about how the other apostles, he says, are they minister of Christ? I speak as if I'm insane. I more so, in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, in beatings, without number, in frequent danger of death. I encourage you to go read that section there in Second Corinthians eleven twenty-three, 23, because part of even serving and being a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ actually brings sometimes hardship. It actually brings sometimes difficulty, sometimes loneliness, sometimes hatred from those that hate Christ. Because you begin to be like Christ. What did they do to Jesus? What did we do to Jesus? We killed him. We put him on a tree. Many a times when we behave the way that Jesus behaved, it's not going to necessarily be a joyride. <laughs> it's not going to be easy. This happened with the Apostle Paul. In fact, 2 Timothy is quite a stark book for us. The Apostle Paul had gone and ministered so effectively that by the end of his ministry, the, the book of Acts says that the whole known world knew about Jesus and the Apostle Paul. That's how effective his ministry was. But at the end of his life as an Apostle, everybody deserted him. Why? Because he was most concerned about honoring Jesus. He would not betray Jesus. And you, you find that in 2 Timothy. He actually writes to Timothy. He says, please would you bring me something warm. Winter's coming. He's in Rome where he wrote the greatest book. I mean, in my opinion, you can have your own greatest book in the New Testament. But the greatest theological treatise is the book of Romans. 16 chapters of absolute wonder in the way in which he argues within the book of Romans. He wrote that to the church at Rome, yet he has to write to Timothy at Ephesus, please bring me something warm, because everybody deserted him. Serving Jesus sometimes comes with great persecution. That's Paul's example. But if you're serving Jesus, you'll be able to say like the Apostle Paul, it's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. What about James' teachings? James 2, verse 14 to 17 says this, What use is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can, this, can that faith save him? 
If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead by itself. So he uses the illustration of somebody's hungry, somebody needs food. You just say, oh, no, just have peace. I mean, what does that really, does that feed him? Does it give him clothes? The point that he's making, he's giving an illustration to point out the fact that some people go, I have faith, I have faith, I have faith, but they have no outflow of that faith in acts of living service to Jesus Christ. And James says that kind of faith is dead. So there's an encouragement for you and me. Are we like the Dead Sea? Just taking, not giving, not flowing? That's the point of this evening if you have missed it at some point. So we called to be good servants, good slaves of Jesus. There's this dual nature of ministry, serving others, which actually brings spiritual nourishment. So we challenged to emulate Timothy's role as a good servant of Jesus Christ in the way in which you and I also live. That's part of the application for you and for me. Let's close in prayer. Oh Lord, I pray that there would be a commitment this evening from your children towards service. At least, Lord, start with a desire in their hearts that they would desire to serve. And maybe they see together this evening and going, I'm, I'm not serving like I should, or I know the areas where I'm gifted, but I've not been doing it. Or maybe there's some here that are weary in the ways that they are serving. Please, would you, O oh Lord, by your mercy, build them up. Give them a big view of your mercy. That you would invigorate their hearts. Lord, we, we don't want to be a people that are talking in terms like the world do with regard to a burning out, but that we would burn up for you. That we would be so on fire for you, Lord, that we would not be lukewarm, that we would not be cold, but that we would be fully hot for serving you, Lord Jesus, ablaze by your Holy Spirit, that we would be those that do your will on this earth. Help us, O oh Lord, we need you. We pray that we would be faithful in the areas that you've called us to be faithful, that we would put one foot in front of the other, faithfully serving you, saying yes to you, Lord, no to the flesh, no to the world, no to Satan, and saying yes to you, Lord Jesus, by the help of your Holy Spirit. And we do pray for your help, Lord. We are very weak. We recognize that even tonight as we are assembled here, we are weak and you are strong. We know that even when we serve, we're not perfect in our service. We battle. We battle along. We limp sometimes. We, we don't serve as well as we should. We get distracted. We, we pray that you would help us and invigorate us by your Holy Spirit. Invigorate us by your word. That we would be encouraged, Lord, to step out even in faith. That we would minister boldly. That we would remain grounded in the truth of your scriptures. And I pray, Lord, that this church at Benoni Bible Church would be strengthened by you, Lord Jesus. That we would glorify you alone. That we would have lives that are dedicated to being faithful servants of Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray this in his name.